and welcome to Deep Impact, a proud member of the Doof Network, where we dive deep into Wild Bo's most spooky work five years on. <laughs> Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. And we are back today to talk about the first chapter of uh, Breach, a new arc, Breach 3.1. And so let's yeah. get right off the, ba- right off the bat, uh, talking about what the hell Breach means. Um, <laughs> what, what meanings are you thinking that, that are going to become relevant, Elliot? Uh, I mean, definitely like a breach, like a breach in your defenses. Like, you know, Mm. if you had a house that no practitioners or others are meant to be able to get into (laughs) and somebody, somebody getting in would be a breach. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. (laughs) Hypothetical. Um, (laughs) yeah, obviously there's the legal definition as well, like a breach in contract and considering Blake is contracted as a, you know, to get married and do all this nonsensical stuff. Um, it, maybe there's something there that will come into this arc. Well, it was effectively right at the end of arc two when he got told he had to meet one of those three, you know, practitioner mm. bump up uh, goalposts within a month. Yep. Um, so, so you I think that's the, the titular breach? I don't know, like a month. You know, I think the last arc went for about three hours. So a month would be a big <laughs> step up for this one. Uh, I guess yep. we'll see few time skips um (laughs) let's dive into it then um and so we do start with what seems like a bit of a time skip uh we've jumped forward some amount of days since blake kicked out maggie um and blake and rose are off trying to summon ghosts uh they're trying to summon a ghost called leonard harlan um to start off with yeah it took me a while to figure out exactly what the time skip thing was there was actually a period where i thought this was about one hour after he kicked maggie out and i was like (laughs) jesus blake go to bed um, hmm. but they mention at one point that Laird is going to be attacking them later that day. Uh, yep. and I think in the Laird's conversation, he said tomorrow. So I'm assuming we've skipped about 24 hours, which, um, hopefully Blake was asleep for all of it. Well, we know that that's not true because Leonard Harlan is the third ghost that they have tried to summon. Um, the other two have both not shown up. <laughs> yeah. And so they've got various hypotheses as to why. Uh, the uh, mm. these other ghosts haven't shown up, but there's definitely a sense that Blake's more in a rhythm at the start of this chapter. Mm. Yeah, interestingly, even though he's kind of failing as we start. Yeah, but it starts from very much a place like he he just comments on like the others that the Briar girl has like walking around the property, which you know that's something they were terrified yeah. of um, when they went to get June uh, and put her in the hatchet and. Uh, yep. You know, like, he's got these fires set up, which, of course, you know, you find out it's just like, oh, I want it to be warm, and also, hopefully, it helps with this scene, but I'm not really sure, but it, it gives me, a, it gave me a vibe the first time I read it of, like, oh, wow, like, look how organized he is, he's got mm. fires set up in some sort of ritual. Yeah, but considering it's only been a few days, I don't know, you, like, there's that old saying that the first time you go skiing, you're you're definitely not going to crash because you're so careful. The second time you go skiing, you you think you're, you know, you think you're hot shit, and so you're <laughs> way more likely to crash into a tree or some shit. Uh, it feels kind of like that to me. Yeah, I mean, it also it kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because June was the safe pick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of picking a ghost, like, and, and so of course that worked out, and now they're not having as much luck. And they're really sort of well, they're scra- scraping, scraping the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so Rose theorizes that Blake's, you know, connection to Leonard isn't strong enough. Um, and Blake, rather than use more blood, thank God, uses some of this hair that he has taken from the fairy, which has started to uh, to grow inside the locket that he put it in. Um, we we only get a bit of the backstory of Leonard as as uh, Blake kind of binds him, uh, but Leonard dives into a bottle. Blake kind of stoppers him up and they head back inside yeah so it's kind of creepy that the hair's growing like out of the locket and up the chain um it doesn't seem to bother blake that much which is which is (laughs) interesting i maybe this is he kind of feels like he should be bothered like i get the (laughs) sense he 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 would be bothered by this but he's just still (laughs) not not back at full like awareness in my mind no he's definitely not and that was part of why I thought at one point that maybe we hadn't really skipped any time. Um, but I, I really liked this scene where they capture Leonard um, mm. because it it really contrasts with the capture of June. Like with June, he actually had to sort of really make a connection with her and understand her, whereas Leonard was almost the opposite. Leonard needed to be like commanded and talked down to. 
Um, yeah. But they had to basically call him a murderer, and I think he only hops in the bottle when Rose is just like, Leonard, wait, do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, he definitely, he, he feels like he his impression is kind of wallowing in self-pity a lot, and so the way to appeal to that is to let him be pitiable and sh- demonstrate that you, you know, pity him or hate him, right? Yeah, Leonard felt a lot more like a uh, recording than June mm. did uh, it, to me. Um, I also, yeah. we have to call out this line where when Blake sort of first sees him, he's like, his eyes, when they met mine, were dead in a way that went beyond his current status, which is just <laughs> a, a great, a great Leonard, little... Yeah, I'm glad we don't get too much of Leonard's backstory because it seems really sad. It, yeah, he, yeah, he had a rough time. Yeah, I don't want to... We don't want to open off that this arc with uh, something that tragic. It wouldn't bode well. Um, so Blake uh, heads inside and welcomes Leonard to the family, uh, introducing him to June, putting the bottle and the hatchet next to each other, which is adorable. Um, he's uh, playing Pokemon trainer, dropping them off at the nursery <laughs> or maybe trying to make some little baby ghosts. Um, anyway, um, and Blake and Rose basically talk for a while and... Rose points out that Blake is really not doing so good, um, to the extent that he seems to have faded. Uh, his skin, his hair, it's all paler and less colourful than it should be. Yeah, it, like, he's not just pale. Like, he's literally mm. fading, like, becoming less opaque is almost the impression I, I got. Um, yeah, totally. It, it, it's kind of terrifying um especially because you know like it's meant to have been at least a day is is my understanding so you think he'd be getting better by now yeah it's not (laughs) yeah he's he's really not doing well although uh blake and rose both notice examining blake that his tattoos haven't faded instead they've become more vibrant and colorful um which is unsettling (laughs) Uh, yeah, cause, and obviously they tie it back to the fact that when he awakened, he thought his tattoos were moving, so yep. uh, it seems like maybe there's more going on with his tattoos, um, I, I don't know, um, I, I guess we'll see, uh, but yeah, they have sort of a couple of different theories about what may be going on with the tattoos, and they basically, the best case scenario is that he's just possessed like Vic was, uh, in yep. that interlude a while ago, which is not a very good best case scenario. Yeah, no, I think we explicitly pointed out during that chapter that this sounded like the worst possible thing that could happen. So <laughs> the fact that that's your best case isn't great. <laughs> yeah. Um, they also think that maybe as Blake becomes weaker, Rose kind of becomes stronger there. Um, and there's like an exchange of power happening, uh, which again, not not a great option. No, no. And they seem to... My understanding of this is that they seem to kind of work off the assumption for the rest of this conversation that that is kind of what hap- is happening, that Rose is yeah. being set up to replace him. Um, yeah, which I'm sure you're happy about. That's uh, your number one theory. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, you throw enough spaghetti at the wall, um, some of it will stick. But yeah. uh, it, <laughs> it, it's um, it, it's interesting because none of them see, or, sorry, neither of them seem that sort of insanely like have their minds blown by the revelation which kind of i think suggests that subconsciously blake has been at least suspecting that this was happening maybe i mean i don't think they seem immediately shocked by the thought that this could be happening i mean they kind of know that it was happening before when um when blake was tapping into the power to kind of bind june right and so this is kind i kind of see that as a bit of an extension of that i suppose um but Hmm. blake I mean, the very next thing that happens is Blake kind of freaks out that Rose is betraying him. And it's not framed as like, oh, you're possessing me, therefore you're betraying me. But I, I definitely think there could be a bit of that link there that makes him think about this next. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, I, I guess we should explain what happens. Blake <laughs> Blake and Rose are kind of talking and, and Blake kind of freaks out a bit. He He's pissed off at Maggie, obviously, still. It's only been a day. He's he's pissed off seemingly less at Laird, which is interesting. Um, yeah. And he, he, he kind of lashes out at Rose, not trusting her, demanding that she makes some oaths to prove her loyalty. Yeah, but it's... He's not being that unreasonable. Like, he also swears that he's planning to help her, you know? Like, it's not... He's not asking her to do something that he wouldn't do himself because he doesn't. Mm. 
I guess that makes it kind of better. I, I, would, I, I don't know. This <laughs> I is don't know. this is one of my pet peeves in you know fiction as well as in real life. I guess when when people get mad that the other person doesn't implicitly trust them, like uh, you see it a lot in in uh, rom coms and stuff, where it's like uh, people get real offended because the other person wants them to sign a prenup. <laughs> Like, I, I don't yeah. think it's unreasonable for both of you to just promise to be on the same side. It, it's so easy and just makes it not a concern. Especially in a world where your word is literally binding, it does kind of make sense to just be like, yeah, I, I mostly trust you, but let's just say it explicitly anyway. <laughs> yeah, because like, Rose's whole argument is like, oh, if you start second guessing everything I'm saying, then like, you know, it, it shows like bad trust and it's only one step from there to, to thinking about like me as your enemy. And it's like that's the mm. whole point. If you if you say it, <laughs> say that you're not, then he knows that you're not. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I was yeah, I was very I, on Blake's side when he he when he says please get the fuck over it to her when she's bringing this. I was like <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh, so they do they do swear loyalty to each other. Um. And then Blake pu- pulls a Blake. Uh. He he basically heads outside calls out to Briar Girl and says, hey, I want to meet. And she kind of sends an other to them to to lead them to her. Um, yeah, it's like, oh, we've been emotionally sorted for 15 seconds. Cool. I have an idea. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do it. Are, are you coming? Like, <laughs> yeah. It's I, classic. I, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it's the same thing he's been doing the whole way through the story, where he just says, <laughs> yeah, I'll run this idea past you, and then he doesn't. Uh, it's It's... It's Blake. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty funny having this like just after this big thing where they do finally hit this sort of understanding uh, after they both do swear the loyalty. Like I think Rose kind of warms up to the idea afterwards, even though she hates it yeah. as it's going on. Yeah. And there's all sorts of tinfoil I can I can say about why she was so against it. But um, <laughs> it, it is very much it's like as soon as they're finally back on the same level, Blake's just like cool. Now I can now I can run off head first um yeah which is just um, yeah so I like him it. blake <laughs> blake says to the other i'd like a promise of protection too bad the thing replied <laughs> just like it yeah. really sets the tone for the kind of negotiations that blake <laughs> is going to do with the briar girl where she's just so uninterested in in this conversation yeah it's a great like fuck you line um yeah yeah it's it's awesome uh, so Blake and Rose basically follow this thing into the forest to meet with Briar Girl, and Blake notices that as they walk, they're getting surrounded by others. And it's interesting, Blake and Rose are kind of having a, a just merry old chit chat as they head on their way. Yeah, like I, I and I, I kind of like. There's a, a bit of a badass line by Blake when Rose is sort of like, "Do you know we're being followed?" Uh, halfway through a sentence, and he's just sort of like, "Yeah, yeah, we're surrounded." But as I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah surrounded, don't worry. Um, <laughs> they talk a bit about a memory they share with their parents, which, of course, Rose mm. only has the one bad memory of them, whereas with Blake <laughs> it happened multiple times. Yeah, I believe it's it's something like, oh, our parents had to forget us a few times before they started remembering us. And then Rose's like, mm, one time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is great. <laughs> Just a classic bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and even there, like, you know, this is sort of the sign that they're in a pretty good place because even they sort of, kind of bond over the discrepancy yeah. like they both actually understand where the other one's coming from on it now so there's actually a bit of like a connection through that discrepancy which is nice um yeah yes but just as they are kind of being weirdly chummy on this quite dangerous walk uh the tone changes when they notice a collection of some others that are uh, dressed in layered bleach skins each wearing an oversized bird skull atop its head it's the bird skull things. They're back. Yeah, I really like this as a sort of show don't tell moment because mm. Blake and Rose never explicitly draw that connection. Like you know, it's just instantly sort of like, oh, this answers that big question of who tried to kill Blake in the second chapter. <laughs> yes, right at the start there. Yep, and of course, it also puts you uh, as the reader back in the head of uh, headspace of like. Well, now we're dealing with someone who's already tried to kill us, like, like you know, yeah. um, and I think that's interesting in particular because, uh, you know, Blake is still really mad at Maggie and refusing to deal with Maggie as someone who, tr- like, well, you know, accidentally killed his cousin. Yeah. Whereas now he's happily dealing with people who have actively tried to kill him. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Briar Girl is kind of openly hostile to Blake throughout these negotiations, but Blake is not needlessly aggressive, right? He's not he he's not trying to offend her or anything. He's here to make a deal kind of in good faith. Yeah, he doesn't really come across as aggressive more as just like um He's not going to take any shit, I guess. Yeah. Um, like yeah, all this totally. stuff where he's like, you know, if you're not going to be a good host, we're just not going to be good guests. Like, um, <laughs> that's that's that. Yeah. I think that really sort of summarizes the mindset of this whole negotiation is, um, like yeah. just being like, look, here's the deal. If you don't like it, then see you later. Yeah, and you definitely get the vibe that Briar Girl is. I mean, you know, she's she's basically explicitly kind of a, a nature spirit, uh, p- being like possessing this girl, and mm. so it's. It's very much like you kind of have to treat treat it very bluntly. You can't just kind of play into the drama or you're just going to fall behind. Yeah, yeah. Um, so basically Blake says to Briar Girl, hey, I know what you want. It's land. I've got land. Do favors for me and I will give you some of my land. Pretty straightforward bargain, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he promises her like a, a half meter by half meter piece. Uh, yeah, feels like a dick move. Yeah, but it's he just like a, a tiny little square and says, "I'll give you this." <laughs> it, yeah, it's very much like a um a little bit of like a an example. It's like, "Hey, let me live yeah. and and I'll give you a bit." And that's sort of his example of if you work with me, I will give you bits of the land and that's what you want. Yeah, and explicitly he he says, "If you kill me, it goes to the next person and then the next person and then the lawyers have it." Um, yeah, that's very much how he comes into this from the position of power. He makes a pretty convincing case that really, if she doesn't work with him, she's probably shit out of luck. Yeah, she's just not going to get the land. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, it's a look. It's a convincing argument. I got to say. Yeah, Briar Girl basically says, "Well, what do you want in exchange?" And his response to her is, "Utterly destroy the Baham and Duchamp families." Yeah. <sighs> um, yeah. I mean, Blake doesn't. Blake doesn't half ass it. I'll give him that. Um, yeah. This feels very much like the end of, I believe it was the first chapter of Arc 2 at the at the uh, council meeting, mm-hmm. uh, where he where pretty he much kind of says, did the yeah, same I'm thing. Fuck shit up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, yes. I, I actually, I think this is quite smart. Like, the Briar Girl is probably one of the best candidates for reliable ally. And she's the right age for Blake to marry, so there's that. Okay, I hadn't thought about that, but I guess. Um... <laughs> Come on, Elliot. That's what that's that's at the front of my mind. <laughs> well, is she the right age? She's like fifteen to eighteen, so maybe not. Maybe that's a bit of a creepy thing to say. <laughs> uh, I don't know, but um, like, yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm still too too focused on the SS Blaggy, but um, it it's uh, <laughs> I, I like the Briar Girl as a potential ally for him because she is very one track and she doesn't really seem. Mm. She seems to be a bit of an outlier, and she's made it pretty clear. There's only one thing in the world that she wants, and he has that, and he's ex- yep. he said that he's willing to give it to her. So I actually think she probably can be counted on more than just about anyone else um, that he has yeah. to work with. She's very open about her motives, and that's nice, because then as long as you're you know, keeping her on side with her very transparent motives, you've got an ally, kind of. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and like, look, I think it's pretty clear Blake is primarily interested in just surviving and then probably trying to get out of the life like he's not really looking to maintain his family's dynasty in in terms of the practicing or whatever so yeah like he he, giving up the land is probably something he'd be keen to do um yeah it's kind of a win-win for him yeah although he he doesn't actually have it right like he doesn't own the land yet no and, and they sort of talk about this in the in the negotiation, but yeah, it's it's with a trust till he's twenty five or something. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, so what do you think? Do you think Briar Girl can be trusted, Elliot? I do, um, which probably means she can't. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I I guess we will see over the course of uh, three point one. Um, so this episode, we've decided we want to dive back into some comments from when this chapter first came out uh, five years ago. Um, and see what kind of the community, how the community was responding uh, at the time. Yeah. Um, so I pulled out this comment from a user called Chiro. Uh, basically, <laughs> I, I just like this because it was really driving home uh, just how much Blake was just improving his plans and not asking permission from Rose. Um, <laughs> it, and it kind of got me thinking about how Blake really is 
kind of just shooting off these promises to Rose left and right um, all throughout these first three arcs that we've seen so far. And he only ever really worries about the one that he's made in the past 24 hours, um, which it can't be good for his, like, pa- power levels, his karma. No, or yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is, is it's not like he's doing this on purpose. Like, that's how he is with himself as well. He often, yeah. by, by his own admission, he's doing things before he's actually figured out why he's doing them. Like, he's very much in, an instincts-driven person, and... um that's not that's not necessarily ideal when you're trying to work as as part of a team well when you make a promise in this world like you are held to that to a large extent and so blake as someone who is improvisational obviously has a has strengths in that in that he kind of does what other practitioners won't do sometimes but (laughs) the downside is he's just gonna forget honestly forget about a lot of the oaths that he is making (laughs) yeah well Part of the reason a lot of them don't always do that sort of stuff is because it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just like that. Com- it was great. Uh, so I have picked a comment by a user called Sean Morgan, who has sort of brings up that um, the bit of, a bit of a pattern that we've got going at the moment, which is all the arc titles are legal terms, mm. um, which is something that I think uh, I had sort of noticed um, because, you know, we've been talking about it and you may have steered me uh perhaps, maybe uh to sort of notice that all these words had legal definitions um mm. so as far as i know sean morgan may have been the first person to pick it up b- back then but you know i think it's just going to be nice that if, if we're out in the open about that now on this podcast as well that you know these are all the pattern seems to be you know in worm it was uh bug related terms and and now we've <laughs> got legal terms yeah and obviously there are obvious reasons why that is um the yeah. whole kind of system of binding and, and stuff and being a practitioner, it's very meticulously worded in a lot of ways. Um, obviously, the lawyers <laughs> exist. <laughs> um, but it's interesting. I mean, this kind of ties on to our discussion from the previous comment, but Blake really is kind of the uh, the Elspeth Tassioni of, of this legal system where he's <laughs> just kind of doing whatever and somehow getting to the right result, or at least sometimes getting to the right result. Um, oh, that's actually a pretty good comparison, yeah. <laughs> For those of you who don't know who we're talking about, <laughs> you need to go and watch The Good Wife. It's a great show. We talked about it on our other podcast, Media MD. Um, but yeah, he's so improvisational and it's so not how this system works, even to the extent of the arc titles reinforcing that, that, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah, yeah, well, it's it's a good idea to have, you know, we've got a protagonist whose focus is on improvisation in a world where you have to think everything through. Um, And he's going to have to, you know, come to terms with that or, you know, keep bumbling his way through a bit. Yeah, Um, and that brings us to the end of our discussion of, uh, of, of... I keep wanting to say bonds. We're two arcs past that (laughs) of Breach 3.1. We will be back to talk about Breach 3.2 in a few days on the 18th of February. But until then, how can people stay in touch with us, Elliot? Um, Well, we're on Twitter. Mm. We are on Twitter. We have a Twitter, (laughs) which is MediaMDPodcast.com. No, (laughs) Twitter.Twitter. we also, you can check us out on our website, which is doofmedia.com. We are a proud member of the Doof Network, um, and you can support us and the rest of the great Doof shows by going to patreon.com slash doofmedia. Uh, and while you're there, uh, don't forget to stop by Wildbo's Patreon, patreon.com slash Wildbo, because obviously he made this. Yeah, he made this thing that we now talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty cool. <laughs> Give him some money. He's making some other cool stories that you should probably check out as well. Um if you want to uh, converse about Breach 3.1, you can find a link to the discussion thread in the show notes on the episode description down below. Um, but until the 18th of February, you'll have to kind of stay on there, and then we'll see you then for Breaches 3.2. See ya. See ya.